Well, good morning. You're saying, what's this guy doing up here today? <laughs> well, it's an honor for me to be able to open God's word for you today and speak to you about subjects that a lot of pastors don't like to talk about. So that's a real honor for me. Yeah. First of all, to get started, it's important to realize that there is only one source of absolute truth in the entire universe. So if you're looking for answers, you got questions you're trying to figure out, whatever trial or even joy it is in your life, if you're looking for the absolute truth and you're looking for God's wisdom to guide you, there's only one place you can go. And that is the Holy Bible. Nothing can be added to the Bible to make it better. Nothing can be taken from it to make it easier to hear or understand. His word penetrates the heart and teaches us the difference between right and wrong. And it provides us a guide through this life. So as we open God's word this morning, keep, let's keep it in perspective that God's not trying to hide from us, that he doesn't hide his will under a rock somewhere that you have to go find, that God wants to engage us and wants us engaged. There's one source of truth that you can go to to engage God, the Holy Bible. Amen. Let me pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you would love us so much that you would see it fit to send your one and only son here, Jesus Christ, your only son, you sent to live a perfect life and pay the ultimate sacrifice for the sin of man. Father, his sacrifice was so powerful, it changes everything. And if we, for a second, underestimate it or glance by it, then we're going to miss all of its power. Father, open our hearts Open our minds and ears so that we can hear you this morning, Father. And forgive the sins of me, the one presenting today, Father. Remove the chaos and dirt from my mind so that I can deliver your word to your people. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. James 1, 17 and 18 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above. Now, I'm just saying, it's not above like the ceiling. Every good and precious gift, perfect gift, is coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Let me read that again. James 1, 17 and 18. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruit of all his creation. Boy, so much meat in those two sentences that we, his people, might be a first fruit. First fruits in the scripture refer to how God calls us to give. And so today, we're going to explore the truth, what God's word has to say about stewardship. The joy of stewardship, I call this, because when we give, when we steward things that God's given us to, there is a joy. And so it's a mental perspective that we need to embrace as we consider our lot in life that God has called us to manage. Stewardship is not merely a word about money. In fact, stewardship doesn't even have finance in or around the making of its word. Stewardship is about recognizing that everything we have belongs to God and that we are called to manage his resources faithfully while we're here. 
so you see, if we are managing God's resources faithfully, then there's joy in that. All that he's done for us. And we can embrace that joy to cultivate gratitude as we dig into the heart issue of what God wants us to think about here with stewardship. So if it's not just about money, what else has God put in our charge? What is our lot in life? Our lot, the Bible describes, is those around, around us, closest to us, right? Um, social media has influencers. Well, they've got big circles of influence. In our little world, it's our family, it's our friends, it's our church. That's, it's those that are close to us. Our lot is those people. Those are the people that we are most likely to impact and deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. These are the people most precious to us, right? God has given us this family. He's given us a taste of love, a taste of his perfect love by providing us our families. We can only grasp the idea of unconditional love because God has given us a taste of that when we see our spouses and we see our children, right? So there is joy in understanding that God has trusted something really big to us. And it's way bigger than just a dollar. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. And then in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This is God's word, absolute truth, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That's the word of the Lord. So what is stewardship defined? It's the responsible management of God's resources that he's placed into our care. It encompasses way more than money. It encompasses our time, our talents, our relationships, and our treasures. And at its core, stewardship reflects our acknowledgement that God is the ultimate owner of all things, just like the psalm said. Amen. In Genesis 1, uh, this is pretty interesting, I think. In Genesis 1, 28, they said, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over every, every living creature that moves on the ground. In Genesis 1.28, God commanded Adam and Eve to fill the earth and to subdue it. Likewise, we are called to manage and care for God's creation. In the parable of the talents, God teaches us that he expects us to be faithful with what he has given us. Let me read this very important scripture to you. Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled the accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five 
Master, he said, you entrusted with me five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Come and share your master's happiness. Verse 24 says, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seeds. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here it is, what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with bankers so that when I returned, I could receive it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For all who has been given more, they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow, pretty strong words. So God calls us to be faithful. We know that. We say it. We sing it every day. But he calls us to be faithful in everything. In everything we do and say and everything we spend, God wants us to be faithful to him because these are not our resources. These are his. Stewardship is also a form of worship. So... Put your head around this for a second. One way to honor God with our resources and demonstrate our trust in God is worshipful. Because we are giving back to the kingdom in faith. There's a term called worthship. It's a word. Worthship means to give something of worth, to demonstratively attribute value especially to a deity or God. So worthship is to give something of worth, something of worth that we've been put in, in trust with. Worship means putting the value you hold for something on display. We love Jesus. That's why we sing about Jesus, right? We're not putting it on display for the world. We're putting it on display because we love the Lord and we want to bring others into his presence. It's worship, putting the value you hold on display. Worthship, to give something of worth, something of value, especially back to God. So the, there is a biblical foundation here of tithing. And, and this is a... Sensitive subject to some, but when we talk about tithe, the, the literal word uh, of tithe, uh, the literal translation of the Greek word tithe, no, I'm kidding, is, uh, is a tenth, it is a consistent biblical principle that's found throughout the Old and New Testament. In fact, in Malachi, this is one of the only places in the entire Bible that God challenges his people he says, test me in this. So Matthew, uh, in Malachi 3.10, God challenges his people to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, the whole tenth. And he promises to pour out more blessing upon them than they are able to receive. Here's the actual verse. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. That's pretty powerful. So God takes stewardship and tithing pretty seriously. 
Is it reasonable to say that tithing then, that stewardship then, is an act of faith? Is it reasonable that we are showing God through our worship and worship, our faith in what he's trusted us with? That's exactly what a tithe is doing. Genesis 14, 18 through 20. Then Mechazeldech, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abram, the God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram, who we know as Abraham, gave him a tenth of everything. You see that? Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. So this idea of tithing predates Mosaic law. This was something that was being practiced voluntarily out of a heart's gratitude for what God has provided. Amen. The blessings of faithful tithing, I call this part. In Philippians 4, it says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And in Proverbs, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. You see, God assures us in these and in this Philippians verse, that he will supply all of our needs. But what's human, what is our human uh, nature? Do we really have a good idea on what we need versus what we want sometimes? I think sometimes we think we want things that we need and sometimes we need things that we don't want. You want me to say that again? <laughs> But God assures us of one thing, that he will supply all our needs so we can trust and rest in that because God is not capable of lying. Every word in the Bible is true, absolute truth. By faithfully tithing, we acknowledge our dependence on God and invite him now to be our provider. Aren't you tired of owning all of that You've got to make more money for the household. You've got to be more successful. You've got to keep up with the Joneses. Doesn't it get a little weary trying to do it yourself? I know it wears me out. But God encourages us to honor him with our wealth, with our promises, and our barns will overflow. Tithing helps us develop a discipline a financial discipline, but a life discipline. We're not talking, remember, just about money here. We're talking about how we use our time, how we interact with people closest to us, the ones we want to give our best to and often receive our worst, right? A tithing helps us to develop a financial discipline, wisdom, and contentment that frees us from materialism. Nancy and I did not start tithing in our life until we couldn't afford to, meaning we had nothing. It was our last hope. <laughs> it, 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 we, it was just, there was just nothing. And out of nothing, you know, we gave 10% of that nothing and started giving faithfully. And I, I can't say let my life be an example of what happens. It's not the way God works. But in our case, God, in every way, opened the floodgates of heaven and poured out more blessing on us than we had room to receive. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to become rich if you follow Jesus. That's not what the scripture's saying. Richness isn't defined by money either. Rich and stewardship, interesting that these two words really don't have finance in them. So through tithing, we can cultivate a generous spirit. In 2 Corinthians 9, 
It says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. When we faithfully steward our finances, we are blessing others and we are participating in God's work, in his calling. As Kenny would say, it don't get no gooder than that, does it really? I mean, so God's saying just have a little faith. Trust me in this. You know, test me in this. Wow. And see what he will do. So as we conclude, I just want to summarize some bullet points here. God trusted you with your life. Not hard to understand, right? God trusted you with your life. Your life is surrounded by people, by people you love, by people maybe you don't love, by people, by things. You have a lot in life that God has provided. This is where we start stewardship from. Our families, our friends, our time, and our tithe. We know from the scriptures that God isn't pleased when we bury the gifts and talents that he's given us into the sand. He buries it into the ground. That didn't work out too well. He blesses what we invest for his kingdom's sake, but not just tenfold. It's more than we could ever expect or imagine. Where else in the Bible have you ever heard, test me in this? My goodness. And we also know that God is not a fan of the lukewarm. The past uh, couple lessons that Pastor Kenny brought us through, you would remember Revelation 3.16. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. So God has trusted you with the lot you have in your life. He expects us to be good stewards of that lot. He blesses us, not so that we can show off and tell the world how successful we are, but for his kingdom's sake. We are here to represent him, and that's it. Tithing is one of those places where the Bible, you know, speaks in words that are so powerful. It, it, it really makes you, you have to, think it through because when the Lord says to test him, have you tested him yet? Have you tried? Test him in this and let's see if he doesn't open the floodgates of heaven and let's see what blessing he will pour out on you, your family, and your lot in life. It can't be any other way because the word of the Lord is absolute truth, brothers and sisters. So, it's all right here waiting for us. To me, from my perspective, you know, what's it going to be? There's no question. It's all or nothing. Belly of the fish, spit out onto dry land, or knowing, feeling, trusting that you are blessed. But with that blessing comes responsibility. As believers, we are blessed. Blessed has no financial meaning. In fact, scriptures say it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than I think a camel in the eye of a needle. So this week, as we go through our journey in life, <laughs> let's pray and think through all that God has put in front of us. Let's think about the lot in life that he's given us and how we might be better stewards. Our lot is all we have. This family, our church family, our loved ones, our community. Think of it this way. It's an honor and privilege to have something, to possess something that you can be a steward of. Maybe you don't have a bank, you know, a, a bank account full of money. That's not 
what the scripture's talking about here. What is it that you hold and possess that's of the dearest, most important value to you? What is our greatest and most valuable possession, folks? Is your salvation story on the top of that list? Is one of the most important and precious things that God has given you? Did it come from this world? Did man lend a hand in creating your salvation? Is it something you can spend and invest in? Well, for the kingdom's sake, did it cost you anything? No. But what did it cost God? It cost God his one and only son, Jesus Christ. That's how valuable you are to him. Amen. Will you pray with me? So, Father, thank you for your word that feeds us absolute truth. Thank you that there's nothing that we can add to it to make it better. There's nothing we can take from it to make it more palatable. Your word is perfect, Father. It pierces the heart. Let it pierce ours today and this week. Father, go before us this week keeping the lot that you provided to us on our hearts and minds. Father, guide us. Give us wisdom as we seek to be better stewards of all you've trusted us with. We love you, Lord. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, oh we're getting ready to eat, so let me pray for our food.